Hello and welcome to Raise Your Average. I'm Pierre Daly, Managing Editor of AdvisorAnalyst.com. My co-hosts are Mike Philbrick and Rodrigo Gordillo from Resolve Asset Management, SEZC. Today, our topic of discussion is going to be focused on branding. Branding, personal branding that is, for financial advisors has become increasingly important, increasingly crucial in the industry, especially because everything is moving online. The internet has become a great resource for individuals that are looking for financial advice, and by the same token, has become a great way for financial advisors to attract new clients, a lot more clients. But in order to do that, you need to have a strong persona online, and this is only possible if you have developed a strong personal brand. Justin Castelli, founder of RLS Wealth Management, an independent registered investment advisor based in Indiana, is here to share his experience with personal branding and much, much more. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AdvisorAnalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. Justin, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on Raise Your Average. Here, thanks for having me, Mike Rodrigo. Great to see both of you. Good to see you too, my man. Likewise to see you too, man. It's been a long time. I think the last time you and Mike saw each other, you guys were, I saw a video of you guys lifting some heavy weights at the gym. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. That was a, that's a heck of a story. Mike, that was Mike, a, 50% of the purpose of the visit. Yeah, Mike, Mike, no, that's what it was. Mike flew into Indy to come work out and then we recorded a couple podcast episodes and then we had dinner with Andrew Miller and his wife. Um, so it was a great trip. I still, to this day, because that's before I even knew Mike real well, I couldn't believe that he took two days from his life to come down to work out and hang out with me, you know, into the new country and everything. So that was awesome. I'm looking forward to repaying the favor. Especially Same team answers, man. Yeah, I guess. It's, it's tough to do with kids. But yeah, I, he was like, Mike was like, you got to come. You got to come. It's going to be fun. I'm like, yeah. I don't know how much fun it'll be after I talk to my wife about it. Right. Well, <laughs> Justin, will welcome you to uh, Grand Cayman when you, uh, when you want to make the trek. So no problem. We've got weights here. We got podcasting equipment. So we're good to go. So let, let's jump in. Why don't you uh, dig in a little bit deeper into your history, the journey that you've uh, uh, lived in, in setting up RLS, RLS Wealth as an independent registered investment advisor in the United States. You've always been sort of at the vanguard of ongoing uh, digital marketing uh, side of things, as well as advisor marketing. So I know you have uh, a, a sort of an advisor growth consulting business, helping advisors grow, and you've got some plans with that. And then you've also got a really interesting uh, third job, if you can imagine that, um, it, with, with OnRamp Invest, which is helping advisors in the U.S., work with digital assets on behalf of their clients and can sort of fold that into a uh, fulsome investment advice. And I think Canadian advisors are going to have an awful lot of um, opportunity to grab, steal, mimic uh, some of the great ideas that you have uh, perpetuated both through your business, uh, businesses, and then on the digital asset side. So why don't you just kind of walk us through your journey to date? Yeah, so um, Pierre mentioned I started RLS Wealth back in 2015, but the story began way before that. Um, long story short, I grew up in Indianapolis, went to a small school south of Indianapolis to play basketball, exit college, not really knowing what I wanted to do, majored in econ, thought I was going to go to law school, and I met my wife. I mean, at the time, she was my girlfriend, but ended up becoming my wife and realized that I didn't want to go to school another three years with law school, so I better figure something out. And I look back on this now and just realized how lucky I was to do the networking that I did and then find my way into a profession that I would end up growing to love because I had no idea that this profession even existed when I graduated. So I went to an insurance brace firm right out of college, uh, went around town and actually dropped off physical resumes at the front desks. Was there for a year, uh, realized I didn't want to use insurance as the foundation for the work that I was going to do and went to a bank, hated working in a branch, hated trying to cross sell, so I got married and then came back from the honeymoon and left to work at a 403B company for about seven years. And that was really where I kind of began to grow into the advisor that would start to form who I am today. That's when I started to find you know, Twitter, 
in some of the blogs. Obviously, I couldn't participate in any of that, but it was opening my eyes to this new way to communicate and brand yourself. So that was a good good period of my time. I was going to leave the 403B company to serve my own firm. And I met a woman in town who was looking for a succession plan and decided that that was a good opportunity at the time. Went to go work with her. Two years in, realized I wasn't going to play out the way I wanted it to and decided to start my firm at that time. And when I first started the firm, I knew I wanted to be independent. I knew I wanted to be on my own. Um, I wanted to have a subscription model to work with young professionals because that was my natural market. And I had some clients that had followed me over the years to kind of get me started. So um, it was fun. And, and I didn't have a niche right out the gate. We may get into talking about niches as part of a good way to grow and market yourselves. I just knew I wanted to work with people that I wanted to be around. And I talked about early on having a, a barbell approach to my business, young professionals on the subscription model, retirees on your traditional assets under management model. And I could, you know, bridge that gap and kind of my love of weights brought the barbell in. And that was kind of how I started the firm. Um, but then you fast forward. So six years uh, on the third of this month, so we're recording this on July 12th, July 3rd was six years that the firm had been around. Um, I've done so many other things that the firm has evolved. I have a team now. Um, you mentioned joining OnRamp. We'll spend more time with that. And then I launched a community back in 2019 with my friend Taylor Schulte, the AGC, which is a private online community for advisors. And it's actually global. We have a few advisors from Canada. We have a couple from India, a few in the UK. And it's a real cool concept. It's just, it's, it's community first. There's a lot of organizations that exist that have a community as the byproduct where we started the, this with the primary focus of being community. And then there's webinars and guest speakers and all these other things that come with it, but it's really the community that pulls everybody together. And there's 150 plus in the community right now. You think about that, 150 advisors who are technically competitors, who are getting together regularly in this online community, sharing best practices, sharing templates, talking about what's going on, asking questions. It's, it's really cool. Of all, of all the things that I've done so far, that might be the one that I'm like most excited about just because it's, there's nothing else like it. And I, I think that it has the potential to make a big impact on the profession. Love it. And you, you were very early in, in embracing sort of the digital media side to bring your message to, I think, sort of the, the world, the broader, the broader um, financial ecosphere. And one of the things that you were always very passionate about was having a, a genuine and personal brand. We'll get into your sneaker collection later, maybe. But I wonder if you could, um, you know, from that perspective, share that journey and, and why that's so important in growing a financial services practice and what you learned from not only realizing this in your own practice, RLS Wealth, but also bringing it to, uh, to fruition from idea to, to community today and what you're seeing with those uh, advisors in your growth community and how they use branding. I think uh, advisors listening to this have a an amazing insight to um, pretty incredible uh, advice with respect to this field of personal branding and how you do that, how you get the message out. So, so maybe you could take us down why it's important, how you do it, your thought process there. Uh, I'm going to put the disclaimer out that I stumbled into figuring this out, what worked for me. And it just so happened that it resonated with other advisors. You know, going back to that small school, I had no marketing classes. What I knew was that when I left to start my own company, I wanted to build a firm where I could just fully be myself. And that's the beginning of personal branding is it's, it's, it's you at all times. So I realized that I'm not going to wear suits anymore. Um, I'm a big lover of hip hop so that I was going to let these little flavors that told you who I was show up in my messaging. I'm a very passive person. You might be surprising to do. See me doing podcasting and videos and all these other things being out and about. You think I'm very like outgoing. When it comes to growing business, I'm never going to cold call. I'm not going to do seminars. I'm not going to ask my clients for referrals. Those are all great ways that people have built their businesses, but that's not me. So it was just natural for me to say, all right, I've got a small group of clients that I can start. And I'm just going to start creating content from the standpoint of educating people. But when I create that content, I'm going to let people get a feeling of who I am. You know, I'm going to have a rap video at the end of my blog post that ties into the, the, the concept that we're talking about. Uh, or I'm going to name my blog All About Your Benjamins, which is a playoff of Puff Daddy's All About The Benjamins. And just these little flavors. And what I noticed was as I allowed a little bit of myself to show, 
that people were really picking up on it and, that, and they liked it. And so that just told me to continue to double down on it. And I think when you think about building your business and personal branding as part of your marketing scheme, people work with people that they like. And there's no way for the potential client to know who you are as a, as a person, as an advisor, if you don't let some of that show. And there's no right formula. Like I couldn't sit down with an advisor and say, this is exactly how you do have, have to do it. It's got to be, it's up to the individual. It's up to the person. It's got to be authentic and you have to be comfortable putting yourself out there. So there's a lot of my family that shows up in my content. Um, every week I do a mixtape. At the bottom of the mixtape, I have usually three pictures of the boys. And I know that that is the only reason that some of my clients ever open that blog post is to see pictures of Roman, Leo, and Silas. But it's just natural for me to do that. There's a lot of people who don't want to put their kids out there. If that's not you, don't do that because I do that. You have to do the things that are comfortable for you because that's what makes it so easy to continue down that path. Um, I, w- I will go and say that I do think every advisor should be creating some type of content. You don't have to do it all, whether that is a newsletter or, you know, I know Canada has different rules in the U.S., so it's a little bit more restricted unless things have opened up in the last couple of years, um, you know, as far as doing video and podcasts and things of that sort. But you've got to you've got to put your voice out there uh, because people want to, to hear who you are, see who you are and get a feel for who you are. And they also want people to have an opinion. You, d- you know, you don't really want to go out and just say something to say something. You've got to go out and say something that has some substance behind it, whether it's uh, loved by everybody or not. That's OK. But people want advisors who are willing to say, this is what you need to be doing or this is what this means and not just be doing social media to, to be out there and say they're doing it. So Justin, uh, walk us through your, your process. Like, how, like maybe share some examples of how your clients, some of your clients, uh, some notable stories of clients who have found you and then eventually ended up on your doorstep, so to speak. Uh, what was, you know, what was the journey that brought them to you? What, you know, if you can trace it back to sort of the genesis where it began, what, what made them want, what, what caught their interest? First of all, uh, I know you've talked about some of that, but maybe if you can put it together and, and sort of walk us through how your client started the journey, found you, and then ended up becoming your client like how did how did that unfold sure I'll, I'll even take everybody through the journey before that happens because you'll start creating if, if content's the direction you go you'll start creating content before that journey ever happens so when you begin to create content nobody reads it nobody listens to it and that's okay because that's probably the worst content you're going to put out uh, then you have family that'll check on it and they'll, they'll give you some feedback and then you'll start to have some of your clients that will give you some feedback and then you'll get that one random person that's probably somebody you knew 10 or 15 years ago that's connected to you somehow on social media, but they saw your blog post and then they reach out to you. And that's, that, that is the first one that really gets you excited because it's somebody who's outside of your inner circle that has reached, read your content or, or consumed it and thought to reach out to you. Uh, so I had one of those. So an example of that, I had a blog post I wrote about that was the red flags of um, full life insurance wasn't necessarily a negative hit piece on that type of in, you know, insurance, but it's just, here's the red flags, things to be careful about. I've worked in a company that sold this before. Here's the things you need to be aware of. And a, a guy that I knew loosely from the gym had his money at a bank. They were pitching him whole life. He's an engineer. He's like, the, the numbers just didn't make sense, but I couldn't pinpoint it. Then I read your blog post and that was perfect. And hey, can you be my client or be my advisor? Um, another similar story to that, I had a blog post about why you should have a will before you set up a 529. People have kids, they, they think about college funding, they don't want to think about death, but you'd have a will set up for obvious reasons, as, as we would all know. Wrote this blog post, put it on social media. Um, I had a girl that I went to high school, actually I dated her my junior year. Uh, she reaches out to me, her and her husband were getting ready to go to Mexico or somewhere and didn't have a will. They reached out to see if I had somebody to connect them to get that document done before they left. And then at the end of the conversation, said, by the way, we're not really happy with our financial advisor. When we get back from vacation, can we come meet with you? And now they've been clients for seven or eight years. So it, you get kind of those one-offs. But then what ends up happening is you begin to build an audience with consistency. And you'll get people who will reach out to you after reading or listening to you for a year. It takes a while sometimes. Sometimes it's real quick. You, you get somebody at the right time that they were getting ready to leave on vacation. They didn't have a will. And this spoke to them and that was perfect timing. Other times it's people that are just reading to learn and they might be reading five or six different advisors. 
But as they continue to read yours, they're, they're building that relationship with you. They're starting to like you. And then there's this tipping point where they actually need help. There's a pain point, changing jobs, retiring, inheritance, whatever it might be. And that's when they decide to make that call. Um, there's a blog, there's a conversation between my friend Tyrone Ross and Josh Brown of Ritholtz on the Human Advisor podcast. And Josh said something that I wish I would have thought of, but basically his, his comment was, you can never make somebody want a financial advisor. We can, we can sit down with somebody and tell them the importance of needing a financial advisor, how we can help them, but you can't force them to want that at that moment, but you can be top of mind when that moment comes, which is the beauty of doing the content, building that audience. You'll be top of mind when that moment comes and then they'll pick that up. So I would, I would tell you as a listener, if you're going down this, this path of creating content, you've got to be in it for the long term, long term. It's going to be work. It's going to be frustrating at times. You're not going to be able to measure ROI. You're not going to be able to say, I did six blog posts. What's my ROI? It, it takes time. But you can see plenty of us that have grown our businesses, grown our brands by doing. I mean, Mike and Rodrigo, like you guys have multiple podcasts. You've been creating content. You've been doing blogs. Like, and that's how you've been able to grow Resolve and everything that you're doing. You've got to commit to it and stay with it. And it, it ends up working. But um, usually the path from reader to client takes some time. And again, it's all building relationships. Um, I mentioned earlier sharing my love of hip hop and family and weights. That's, I never thought that anybody would say, oh, I want to work with him because he likes hip hop. I wanted to share all those qualities about me so that if somebody liked everything else about me, they weren't offended if they heard me listening to rap. Like, I don't want like, to, I listen to, to rap with the boys in the car. It's, it springs out, windows are down. I don't want to worry about rolling up next to a client in town and be bumping some music that turns them off to me because they didn't know. Um, so those weren't the hooks I was trying to go for. I just wanted anybody who wanted to work with me to yep. really know who I was and what to expect when they came in. And if they didn't like any of that, then they're not going to call me and that's perfectly okay. Um, but in the final example I'll give What's was, it? sorry, uh, I had one more, one more good, good from it. One of my largest cold yeah, go ahead. Girl, or cold clients that came in off of content was a retiree. And his comment that stuck out to me after our first meeting was, the fact that I had a family picture on my about me page really resonated with him. He liked the fact that my family was so important that I put it on my website. Interestingly enough, when I rebranded my firm and brought, built out a team, I don't have my family picture on my company website anymore. Uh, but I think I'll bring that back in the future. But so you, you're never going to know what's going to be that one thing that somebody really likes, uh, which is why I think it's just so important for you to be yourself, because then you don't have to uphold some image that somebody thought was real. If I was putting out that um, I loved golf and somebody said, oh, I saw you in the golf course. That's great. Like, I hate golf. So now if somebody comes in thinking that I love golf, I have to live up this fake, pers this persona that I love golf and I hate it. Like, I don't, I don't want to be anything that I'm not. So that's the beauty of being able to create your own content is you get to put yourself out there. And you know what the, the interesting thing about all of that is that we've been taught, I think anybody who's been in the business of finance, especially in private wealth has been taught that, you know, you need to find your niche market and, you know, figure out a niche and then find the niche of the niche of the niche of the niche. And you try to do it locally. And, you know, there's enough books out there that show that this is a very viable way to do things. But if you're in a small town and you have, and your only way of reaching people is through flyers, local town halls or cold calling, because you can get there locally then the niche of the niche example really doesn't play out, right? It really, when you're doing content, you're reaching the world. I mean, Resolve is a global firm because we put ourselves out there to the world. Now you're registered in the United States and most of the advisors that you work with and, and help are registered in the United States, which is a massive um, place. But content, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, what you're really doing is you're putting yourself out there, your personality, um, the, the things that make you, you and quirky and, and provide value and create a sense of, of um, connection with your prospective clients. I, I imagine that, you know, you're expanding the network beyond your state, your town. Uh, and that's part of the reason that this thing ends up working really well, where you can be yourself and make a living doing it. Would you say that there's a little bit of an element to that? Definitely. And if that's what you want, not everybody wants to be, you know, working with clients across the country. For me, I wanted to have, I want to have clients across the country. So that gives me an excuse to go travel and visit them and, and things of that sort. But I think coming out of COVID, 
it, I, more advisors have been opened up. Yeah, we've been meeting on Zoom for the last year and a half. So why, why limit yourself to your local area? Might as well branch it out. And then that's where you could have, a, have more success having a niche. To your point, Rodrigo, if, it's, if you're working with a very specific niche, there may only be so many veterinarians or whatever it might be in your hometown. But then you open it up to the, to the country. Now you've got more to go at. Um, I will say that when I started, I mentioned I, I didn't have a niche. I actually wanted to be an advisor that showed that you could have success without niching down. Uh, so I was almost anti-niche. Part of that was because I didn't, there was no group of people that I was so excited to be around that I would want to work with all the time. Like the very easy answer for me would have been Eli Lilly's global headquarters is in Indianapolis. I should have gone and learned everything about Lilly's 401k plan, their stock options, and then just worked Lilly. But that didn't excite me at all. So I just wanted to work with people. But what I found is over time, the niche ultimately found me. And I'm in an interesting spot now. Right. I'm, I'm not trying to grow my firm anymore because of some of the other things that I'm doing. It's basically maintain the relationships I have, continue my, my love of marketing and branding for the firm so I can experiment and help other advisors. But if I were going to be growing my firm, it would be with forward-thinking individuals. And, and it's, it's my niche is more mindset. It's people who don't want to be boxed in. You could call them dreamers or trailblazers. There probably is a lot of entrepreneurial spirit that's in there as well. But I just, I want to work with people who don't want to live by the constraints of society, that they want to write their own story. They're going to do things their own way. And they're going to need somebody who's going to think outside the box as an, as an advisor to help them do that. And that is who I want to help going forward. And I think that I'm even closer to saying, I want to work with like the Jack Butchers of the world. I don't know if you're familiar with Jack Butcher. Um, he founded Visualize Value, which is kind of like, a, he does marketing and branding, but he has this very distinct creative style of doing images for kind of like quotes. He's worked with Carl Richards with some of his stuff. Anyways, Jack is like way ahead of the game when it comes to creativity and, and creative business. And like, I want to work with people like that because there's a need to help those type of individuals. But also I'm surrounding myself with these people that are extremely creative that I get to feed off of and learn from. So if I ever go back to growing my business, that's the niche that I want to go towards. And, and but, and, but I, I actually, you know, I understand the confusion there with regard to niche because I didn't kind of close the loop. I think what I meant was exactly what you said is by you putting yourself out there, what you're, what you're writing about, what you're doing videos about, what you're tweeting about, it has to be genuine. And when you do that, you end up attracting, so, uh, people end up auto-selecting, right? Self-selecting. They, they say, okay, that's a guy I can work with, stick with, because this, this is a business based on values. And if your values align with the people that found, found you and really liked you and the picture of your family, that's your niche. And then to be in people with similar personality or similar values-driven type of, of advice that ends up being the niche that you actually want to work in rather than having to find the niche that makes the most sense, even though you hate doing it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It draws, I, I, as exciting I, as dentists are. I'll add, I'll add that, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that, you know, we're talking about niche marketing. There's, there's obviously been a lot written about this. So, you know, you, a lot of advisors, of course, are out there working, looking for clients who fit a certain category or certain niche and try to identify that and, you know, find out where to surface and find them. But in, in, in a way, like what you're, what you've done and what I, I, I tend to agree with it, which is that you become the niche, you know, by building your own brand, you become the niche that clients want to, that, you know, as Rodrigo said, auto select you because, you know, they, they found a real person, somebody who's not afraid to put themselves out there and, you know, show this is who I am. This is my family. This is how I think. And, and, um, one of the interesting things that sort of happens, you know, we're as it ha as all having been advisors at one time, um, you know, we, we, we're always, always getting it drummed in our practice from a compliance perspective to know your client, you know, know your client, know your client, you got the KYC, you got to figure out what their risk tolerance is, all that, you know, all of the, uh, personal evaluation that comes with that, getting to know your client's needs and wants and risk, you know, that's, that's something that's drummed in at the compliance level to every advisor. But what isn't drummed in is that your clients don't know you, right? 
like, you know, more often than not, there's, there isn't a know your advisor rule where, where you say, you know, you have to make an effort as an advisor to get your clients to know who you are, your prospective clients. And, and that seems to be something that, that there's a lot of barriers to, in fact, I mean, at least I think a lot of advisors have just given up on marketing outside of the investment sphere where they don't, you know, they're, they've been told you can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. Uh, you know, they're like the frog in the jar. Eventually, even though the lid gets taken off, you don't jump out anymore. You don't try to jump out anymore because you're tired of hitting your head on the, on the top of the jar. Well, that, that's a, that's and, a good and, point here. Like how, how, so maybe, maybe the, you know, Canada is dominated by a few large banks to some degree. And, but there are some other more independent advisors here in Canada that can do some more unique stuff. But I'm wondering if that dovetails well into the advisor growth community, Justin, how did your membership there deal with what Pierre's talking about? Like, how do you break free of that glass jar, uh, start small, or what have, what have been some of the strategies that you've seen for advisors to evolve? Well, being that it's so easy here in the States to set up your own firm, a lot of times it's go hang their own shingle. Go set up their own RIA, register with the state. I know it's, I know it's expensive to do that up north if, if at all, you know, possible. So I th- think that's the in, inside the agency. That's these. Although Mike, when we were in um, the conference for ETF in Canada, we had dinner with Sam Rook, and Sam, I feel like, yeah. is doing a tremendous job up in Canada. He's he's figured out how to navigate those waters with compliance, and is doing video and putting himself out there. So. Um, I would say go follow Sam on LinkedIn and watch what he's doing and then take that to your compliance department and say, hey, he's in Canada. He's an advisor doing it. It's within the rules. If we don't start doing this, we're going to lose out to, I forget where he's at. But um, so I, I think that it. I would add uh, um, Shiraz Ahmed at uh, Rich Raymond James has also been able to be a young advisor that has done a similar thing. Look him up on LinkedIn. Um, yep. He's got videos. He puts his people from well, the time he leaves the house to goes to work, puts his camera in the car and just talks and lets people know who he is and what he's thinking about. And then, so the, and that's an easy point. I think it's a great, a great example, right? Of um, to, to your point, Pierre, it is hard, right? And so many advisors will say, well, it's too hard. <laughs> but this, as per the usual, the magic lies alongside the discomfort, you know, get comfortable with being uncomfortable, be navigating these waters and it's hard, but that means that there's alpha there. There's business alpha in taking the time to navigate the compliance labyrinth in order to create the message that is true to you, that is authentic for what you are and for you to, as Justin said, say something. You, you can't be all motherhood and the same as everybody else. If it's the same as everybody else, how on earth are you going to stand out as that differentiated advisor in order to be the one chosen at that moment of desire? As Justin pointed out earlier, it's most of the time people are pretty happy with what they're doing. You want to position yourself with the most amount of people possible that they think of you when they're unhappy with what they're doing. Yeah. And which is, you know, when I, when I remember when I started and I tried my hand at wealth, uh, the wealth management, the, I cold called and I got a team that cold called and the result after analyzing who became clients was the fact that it were people that liked my personality and were just about to switch an advisor. So you're just, my touch points was a phone call and I got lucky. How much luckier can you get if you have enough content out there hitting people at the right place at the right time who meet the, the similar characteristics they're looking for an advisor? You just get more, more hit points if you're consistent and persistent about it. Uh, so, yeah, I agree. I think the Americans made it to the moon not because it was easy, but because it was, at, it was hard. Um, it, it is hard and it is niche and different type of use. It is complicated, but uh, because it's hard, you have alpha. Yeah. What would you say, Justin, what are the what are kind of the, a couple of the top things that you're seeing in the community that have really worked or driven to some success for advisors? Just to share the advisors, just to like, like we did on the, on the personal side of you having some successes, what are you seeing in there? Just to get people excited about actually taking that next step and um, uh, journeying into this, this uh, slightly different path. 
two things I would point out. One, kind of tying into what Rodrigo talked about, the, the people on the other, uh, other end of the phone liked his personality. Video is still very, very impactful. A lot of the advisors are having a lot of success doing mm-hmm. video. And one, the algorithms love it. If you can stay within their time limits on LinkedIn of under 10 minutes or two minutes on Twitter, it gets a lot of love on the algorithm. So it gets circulating more. But if you go back to people like working with people that they, that they, they like, they work with people that they like, how better do you get to know somebody than visually? So with a video, you can see me, you can hear me, you can see my mannerisms and you can decide, okay, I don't like that guy's style or I do. Versus if you're just writing a blog post, it doesn't give as much of a, a flavor of who I am. So video is good for a lot of fronts. And then the final reason people are having success with it is they're able then to take that one piece of video and turn it into a, a small podcast episode, or they can turn it into, they can have it transcribed and turn it into a written blog post. So I've been, I've been loving video for a long time just because of the, the ability for people to see and get to know me. You build that relationship easier um, over video, but then the ability to chop it up and cl- create multiple types of content for one piece. Uh, the other one that I slept on, and I began to see a lot of traction and progress with it, is an email newsletter. So I always stayed away from email newsletters because I hate email. I get so much email, I don't want it. But what I learned, I have a newsletter I put on the back burner for now that I call the Advisor of Tomorrow. It was a twice a month newsletter to advisors talking about marketing, branding, those types of things. But the inbox is very intimate. If somebody says, yes, I want to subscribe to your newsletter, then they're going to read it when it comes in. And if you continue to to give them good content, they're going to stay with it. Um, and some of my most engaging pieces of content, take the podcast, the videos, the blogs, the most engagement I got was from the email newsletters. I had conversations going back and forth between other advisors that were reading my stuff, whether they were giving me feedback or sharing things that they learned or just going back and forth. So um, email may be an easier way to go. That's not as out there. So maybe compliance is a little bit more okay with that, but don't sleep on email. If you can put together a good, um, email newsletter campaign that that goes a long way. And if you think you have to come up with with original content for every email campaign, you don't. Uh, there's a lot of value in um, curating content for people. So my my advisor newsletter was a little bit of my own thought, and then the rest of it was curation. Now I tried to find videos and articles and blog posts you wouldn't have found anywhere else, so it brought you value. But I saved you time as an advisor. You didn't have to go seek. You didn't have to go seek this out. I'm bringing it to you every other week and you can trust. And there's building trust there. It's building relationships. You can do the same thing for clients. You know, if you have clients that are young professionals, write a little something that's, that's unique to young professionals, put your thought out there, and then give them content that's going to help them in their lives. I love it. It's, um, yeah. It is amazing how um, with email having higher and higher levels of accountability around it as well. So in Canada, there's a lot of rules about making sure you have consent and in Europe and the US, US is probably a little bit lighter, but generally speaking, it's easy for someone to unsubscribe. So when you're, when you have that permission to enter that email inbox, um, you know, it is, as you said, it's, it's fairly hollow ground, hollow to ground, and, um, it can make for some uh, some great opportunities to further the message that you have in the rest of the digital world. I mean, it's complimentary. So you've got your video where they're seeing you, they're hearing you, they're seeing your, um, uh, uh, body language. And then you compliment that with the written word in the email. Um, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, I think a lot of magic there that, that is covered in, in those basics and then being obviously true and authentic to your, your message. That's great. One, one I wonder that I, uh, we can go ahead. Uh, just, I, one thing that I've heard a lot of people talk about that I tried to get into is voice technology. So like on the Amazon devices, you can have flash briefings and skills. And we have one at OnRamp. But for, for a financial advisor, it was hard for me to consistently do a flash briefing. I tried to do one every day where I would like break down something from the news or I would talk about a topic. And then the goal is to get yourself into people's morning routines. So the, the argument is people will begin to use voice technology more and more in the future. You know, Alexa, what's my news? And you can subscribe to different news outlets. So as they're getting ready or they're making breakfast, drinking their coffee, it runs through all of their major news headlines. You want to get yourself in that, that, that uh, system. 
I had a hard time doing that because I couldn't come up with enough consistent things. But if you're looking to try to get ahead of the curve, I think voice technology, it, I do believe voice technology will become more and more useful. I do think more people will use it. If you can figure out a way to get there ahead, that gives you an advantage. Um, I don't know where that falls under the compliance landscape, but that's something that I, I wasn't successful at just mainly because I couldn't get the consistency to, to make it work. But it's, if you've got enough to talk about or you're able to, that's a, a good area to be because there's not very many advisors living in that space. Love it. Let's do, you mentioned on ramp. I want to talk about on ramp as well because I think it's it is a uh, an absolute fabulous opportunity for uh, American RIAs and advisors, of which I'm sure there'll be a few listening. In Canada, we also have you know some ETFs in the digital asset space that make that a ap- more approachable asset class. But but uh, tell us tell tell the audience what's on ramp, what's its purpose, what's your role there, um, how's that changing the world. Yeah, so I so on ramp I joined back in I would say May. So I on ramp invest is an iPass, an integration platform as a service. So think of like we know SaaS programs uh, with technology. What I what what iPass is going to be, what on ramp is, is going to be the center of bringing crypto assets to the advisor workflow. Meaning that we are going to be the piping, the roadmap, the uh, the highway, the railroads to everything within the advisor. So CRM, financial planning software, portfolio management, we are going to link the crypto asset world to those areas for advisors to be able to help them help their clients, whether that is being able to view held away assets. So your clients have a Gemini or Coinbase account. You know, right now you can't plug those in to see what's there. OnRamp so- solves that. Or if you want to be able to trade for them, we have a relationship with Gemini and Prime Trust. And those numbers, those, those custodians will grow as well, where you can actually buy and sell Right now, it's just Bitcoin and Ether, but it'll it'll grow as time goes on. You can actually manage the crypto asset for your clients. And then we have a whole suite of education because advisors are reluctant to go down this path because it's new, it's you know, it's fake money, it's not real, but we need to educate them on that. So OnRamp's mission is to kind of help advisors. Tyrone came up with this. So Tyrone Ross is the CEO. He, I know he was on your other show last Friday, uh, but he's come up with the acronym yep. EAT. We're going to help yep. advisors. We're going to educate provide access and give tools to advisors when it comes to the crypto space. For me, it is is exciting because I started going down the path of crypto back in 2017. Um, Just clients were asking about it a little bit. I heard about it some more. So I just started doing my own research. And then I started sharing it on my blog. Hey, here's some great blog posts that I read. Again, curating, but like documenting my education as I went along and saw where it was going to be a part of the practice eventually. Tyrone and asked me if I could come help with some marketing and branding um, on a part-time role, but then it's evolving to where I'm going to be uh, chief of staff now. So I'm, I mentioned not growing RLS anymore, kind of keeping that where it is to be able to dedicate more time to the on-ramp business uh, because I'm, you know, I've been being, I've been a financial advisor for almost 17 years. I love being an advisor. I don't want to stop being advisor, but when I think about my next 17 years, I don't really want to continue to take on new clients. This opportunity with OnRamp excites me. And what I've worked real hard in the way of positioning my business is to put myself in a, a, to be in an opportunity where I can follow my passions. Um, that's what I try to encourage my clients to do. I talk about following their, their passion and their purpose and pursuing those. And that's what I want to do as well. So that's why OnRamp to me is so exciting because we will change the way that financial services first in the U.S. operates but we'll take it. We'll, we should be able to take it global once everything gets up and running. And from the standpoint of it's starting with crypto assets like Bitcoin and Ether, but there's this whole decentralized finance world out there of DeFi that we're going to be bringing to it as well. So opportunities to get more money on your cash than just sitting in a money market using stable coins and other things that aren't really that risky. You just don't understand them. And you see 4%, there's got to be risk. But once you understand them and learn it, you see they're not that bad. So we're going to bring all of that to the, the advisor workflow, which is exciting for me because, Mike, you know that we worked with the same gentleman, John, to kind of come up with mission statements. And I was so impressed that when you told me your mission statement, you had to condense the three words. I condensed mine down to one, and it's impact. Everything that I do, I want to have an impact. I want to have impact on my clients' lives, but that on-ramp allows me to have impact on the profession in a way that I could never do on my own. So that, to me, is really, really exciting. You had to outdo me. Well, that's fantastic. You had to outdo. You had to go. To- <laughs> I, I'm going right? to a letter now. 
That's right. Change your name to a letter, Mike, a simple. I'm going to go with the simple. I'm going to take the Prince route here. That's all I'm going to do. Can't believe you. You have to, you have to make it, as, and so, you have to make it as a competition to egg me on. You know, it brings out the worst. And... That's right. It's going to be great. We're still at, can't see the Twitter, or the Twitter fight that we're going to have. Uh, so we're, Justin, we're, what's up here? As we, I, as you roll, we're, 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 I was just going to say before we continue, we're, we're at three words times two. We've got, you know, insight is capital, raise your average, right? So yeah. when you, you know, it, it's true, the more you can, you know, the, the hardest thing to do is, is to, um, write a headline and, and, and have it not be this incredibly long headline that, that tries to explain what's in the article. I think that's the, uh, that's the hardest guilty. thing to do. Yeah. The most guilty at resolve of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so Justin, as you, uh, as you guys work on OnRap, I mean, it's, it's legitimately is like first to market on all this stuff, even before the regulations have been fully clear for advisors on anything crypto. I know that there's a, the ability for advisors to uh, purchase the close end funds in the US that have some Bitcoin and, and some Ethereum. But where do you see the landscape uh, for that and advisors' ability to even talk about this, uh, that type of product? And who's going to be your first client to, to get you there? So we, we actually already have clients on the platform who have placed trades to buy and sell Bitcoin and, or Ether. So um, it's, it's already happened. We're, the regulatory requirements al- or re- the regulations allow advisors to do that, provided they have the right E&O and everything. E&O is the biggest hurdle for smaller advisors like my firm. Um, it's expensive. I got quoted 30 to 40 grand a year for a million dollar E&O policy to be able to do crypto. Um, so that's one of my things. I want to find somebody to be able to help because for a firm of my size, that's just not, doesn't make sense. And that's to buy the individual. Now you can get E&O that's more cost effective if you're doing the trusts and ETFs, whenever that comes. But I, I'm in the camp of, if you're going to own crypto, you might as well directly own the, the crypto asset. Like if I want Bitcoin, I should just go buy Bitcoin. There's no reason to buy an ETF. Um, I can do it on my own, cheaper, hold it myself, have more control. I wouldn't go buy an, an ETF of Apple stock. I'm just going to go buy the Apple stock. So why would I do the same thing? Or why would I do that with, with Bitcoin? Um, I think that the, the good thing, though, is I do think there's room. Like Competition's good. There's room for a variety of products out there. I think an ETF will be good um, because that'll give people the convenience of holding it. It's not the, the most efficient way to, to, to get it, but it does have some convenience. You don't have to worry about storing it. It's taken care of for you. Um, you can have it in ETF, you get IRAs and, and regular accounts. So it does make it easier, but I think there's going to be options. There's SMAs that are already out there um, that are they're buying Bitcoin and Ether for clients as well. Uh, there's just going to be a lot of education that needs to be going with these different venue, these different uh, vehicles for owning it. Because, um, you know, with the ETF, you're not going to actually own the underlying Bitcoin, meaning Rodrigo, you as an investor can't go take that Bitcoin and put it in your, your cold storage. It's a part of the ETF. So it's kind of like having an IOU to the price of Bitcoin. But on some of these SMAs, or if you buy the Bitcoin, your, your advisor buys it for you through OnRamp, now you as the investor can take that, that your keys and go store it um, yourself in cold storage. You can loan it out and get some interest. There's lots of more, there's lots, there's a lot more opportunity for you as an investor in that landscape. But Investors aren't going to know which one offers all those features. So there's going to be a lot of education that needs to go on. But I think that the, the landscape is just going to continue to grow quickly, um, which is not I, a bad thing. I would also offer, yeah, th- this, is, this has gone from, uh, if you're an advisor three years ago talking about crypto or digital assets, that was career risk. I think we're changing now where it's becoming career risk not to talk about it. If you don't. And I think if you're advertising yourself as, yeah, if you're, if you're advertising yourself as a fiduciary, you cannot say, oh, don't do anything with crypto until you educate yourself. You must fully go through the continuum of education. Then once you've done that, if you come down on the side of it's a frontier asset class, it has too much risk. You need to wait. It's only a trillion dollars, et cetera. Then fine. You could detail that for the individual client. To dismiss it out of hand, which is, a, I, I see more often than not, unfortunately, I think is a, an error and is not congruent with the fiduciary mindset. 
But you don't have to come down on the side of, yes, you should invest at the end of that, but you have needed to do work. And I, I want to, I want to emphasize that whether you are in Canada or in the U S well, wherever you might be globally, that the amount of education that on ramp has put on their site is substantial, meaningful, and very helpful, not only from a, a philosophical perspective, but also in the dashboards that they offer, what does the inclusion of this asset class add? Uh, there's, you guys are probably one of the only other shops that I've ever seen write a piece on Shannon's demon besides ourselves. The fact that you can add a highly volatile asset class to a portfolio and the portfolio's volatility goes down. And these are, you know, sort of types of, uh, philosophical portfolio construction mechanics that you need to understand and think about. Uh, and there, you know, there's a lot, it's a frontier asset class. It's a new world. It's, it's, it's got lots of all to it, but what I'm, what I guess I want to come back to is on ramp is providing an immense social good for advisors everywhere. Even if you're in Canada, let's say you have access in Canada, we have greenlit several ETFs, both for Bitcoin and for Ether. And so if you want to know as an advisor, well, what's the impact of adding that to a portfolio? Go to OnRamp, look at the education site, sign up. I think the first 30 days is free. And if you put in advisor analyst, uh, they'll, they'll make it even freer. It's free still. Uh, the, the, the code <laughs> advisor analyst will get you for you for free yeah. too. Um, anyway, that will give you some of the tools that you might want to look at and see, well, what happens to a portfolio if I add, add Bitcoin? Is there anything else you would, you would highlight there, Justin, in the, in the educate side? Well, well, first off, thanks for the for the plug on it. But I, I think one of the things that's so nice about the Onrip Academy is it is a separate entity on its own. If you go to the the package or you go to the platform where you're trading and everything, it's included. But you can just go straight to the academy, and that'd be the only relationship you have with Onramp. Uh, the pieces in there really are research driven. They're designed to educate. They're not sales tools for OnRamp. Now, we know that as we educate you, it's going to be a very easy, natural pro progression over to working with us on the other side. But it really is all about education. We're leading with educate uh, education because we know it needs to be there for clients and for advisors. And I would agree with you, dismissing the asset class can no longer be done. I think you run the risk of losing business if you do that. Um, and I agree with you 100%, Mike, that if you can, if you go through the whole process and you come up with the, with the uh, decision that it's still not right for your clients. There's no, there's no flaw in that. I think that's perfectly okay. As a, as putting myself in my client's shoes, I would much rather hear my advisor say, here are all the reasons it's not good. I've spent time, I've learned about it. I've bought some of it myself to see how it works. And here are the reasons I don't think it's right for you versus, eh, it's too new. It's not real. It's going to go away. It's a Ponzi scheme. We're not going to deal with it. I just think you lose credibility because you, it's, it's obvious that you didn't put any time into it. So being able to have a conversation intelligently about the asset class, I think every advisor needs to be able to do that. Where you'd end up falling on the line of yes, no, maybe a little bit, it doesn't matter. I just think you need to be able to talk about it because more and more people and people you wouldn't expect. I talked to an advisor that had a 75 year old who wanted to give each one of his grandkids one Bitcoin um, and he needed the advisor to help him buy it. But this is, you would think, oh, a 75 year old is not going to want to deal with crypto assets. Well, Maybe not for himself, but he may want to do it for his grandkids. Uh, so you need to be able to talk about it intelligently. And also, I mean, the problem with not having a professional advisor, getting professional advice on how to deal with this new dynamic and volatile asset class can lead to adverse effects for those investors where they go down a YouTube rabbit hole that yeah. gets them to invest 100% of their net worth at the age of 65 into Bitcoin right before it drops 50%. In contrast to a platform, an advisor that allows you to educate as to what a hundred ball strategy or a, a asset class will do to your portfolio from a positive perspective of rebalancing and ensuring that you can rebalance and that there's somebody watching, there's somebody there to educate you on it, whether you're gonna read it, watch a video, or actually talk to a human being about it. It's important from a regulatory perspective for the regulators to allow and encourage the inclusion in a thoughtful and, um, and, and fiduciary pro, a, a way to, to include that asset class. So, I mean, I definitely think that um, the crypto space, and you guys are a big part of this, has uh, 
is going to win because of the amount of education thrown at the space. In in contrast to like, you know, a lot of these uh, closed end funds or structured products that are out there that have come with very little education and just pure trust. There's a lot more to read about on the crypto space than yeah. than all that stuff that we I think I, use all the time. I think as an advisor, you really, you know, you really want to go out of your way to have these conversations with it, with your clients about assets that like Bitcoin that you might not actively recommend, but I can't, you know, I, I regret, you know, in terms of my time as an advisor, there were these limited partnerships that I refused to recommend to my clients. And two clients came to me during that offering period and said, uh, I'm changing advisors, right? And I said, why? And they said, well, the other advisor has this tax shelter limited partnership thing. Uh, I won't name it, but, um, you know, why didn't you talk to me about it? I said, I didn't talk to you about it because it truly wasn't relevant to your case or it wasn't suitable for you, whatever the reasons, you know, the actual reasons were. But in hindsight now, I regret that I hadn't brought it up just as a matter of awareness, just to say, you know, there's this thing going on right now. You might've read about it and maybe you don't, you know, or you don't know about it, but you know, here's why I haven't talked to you about it. <laughs> it's right? funny, like it's, you want to be proactive, especially in the case of an asset class that has had pretty substantial growth over the last six months to a year. Uh, it's quite possible that if they bought, I don't know, in 2014 or 15 or 18 and 19, all of a sudden a very small piece of their portfolio has become a very large piece of their portfolio. And you as the advisor are unaware of that and you're unable yeah. to provide advice on potentially rebalancing. Uh, wouldn't it have been nice to rebalance the portfolio in January, February, March, or April um, to have that particular allocation and then be rebalancing again now as you roll through a period of, of subsequent low returns after subsequent great returns? So I think there's there's a, a lot there to be had. So just what are you guys seeing at OnRamp as being the 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 modus operandi as, as advisors are starting to brace the technology. I, I imagine it's falling into it. There's probably a few advisors that are using their knowledge around crypto as sort of a niche market, as a, a tip of the spear to penetrate larger wealth assets, right? So if your advisor hasn't talked about it, well, let me tell you about it. Um, so do, are you seeing that? And, and then also are you seeing sort of more broad adoption as a two to 5% allocation in sort of the more traditional uh, portfolios? Well, what, what's coming on ramp in that respect? Before we get to the allocation side, another thing we're seeing that I was gonna add on to what you're talking about, Mike, there's a ton of planning opportunities. Even if you don't wanna allocate to crypto for your clients, there's estate planning needs. These accounts don't have beneficiaries. How do they get transferred to the next uh, next of kin? Do they know where the keys are? Pass exactly. The tax planning behind it, you, you mentioned rebalancing, but right now there's no wash sale. So you could sell it and buy it right back and then establish new cost bases. There's all these opportunities that even if you don't want to advise on the purchase, if you know they have it, you can say, hey, it's down, go sell it and buy it back, reestablish new cost bases. Now we've got losses on the books to carry forward and you've created tremendous value. So there's a lot of planning alpha when it comes to, even if you're not allocating to it. As far as what we're seeing with advisors, interestingly enough, the the people who have a lot of crypto wealth are probably never gonna work with an advisor with it. They've, they've got it on their own, they're, they're crypto hippies and they're gonna do it on their own. But what you, what you highlighted, Mike, is very true. You had people who dabbled in it over the last couple of years, and now it's grown to a point of being a larger amount of money that they're comfortable managing on their own. Um, so they're gonna start seeking advisors. So I. There are advisors that are using it to market themselves, but it's more to market themselves to a younger investor than it is to get to the high net worth. Uh, the high net worth, we do have advisors that, you know, we have RIAs that are managing hundreds of billions of dollars that are on the platform. So they're talking to their, their ultra high net worth clients with it about it as well. But I do think we're going to see a lot of advisors that, that buy into the 2 to 5% allocation. And interestingly enough, you and I, Mike, when you came out, you you gave me the numbers about like even your one percent. It's got to be enough volatility for it to make it work. And I just never thought I would subscribe to a one percent allocation being worth it. But with, with the data set that we have, one percent for Bitcoin does move the needle 
in, in the directions we want it to. So I think we'll see some advisors do the two to 5% allocation. Um, and then you'll have those that'll kind of market. I don't know if we'll see the days of cold calling, you know, is your advisor talking to you about Bitcoin? If not type of approach, um, there may be a handful, but I think a lot of what we're seeing is advisors educating themselves in public and using that as marketing. And I saw it for, <clears throat> excuse me, I saw it firsthand. One of my younger clients that came to work with us in the last six months, he had been following me for a while on Twitter and just saw that I, I was talking about crypto and Rally Road. I don't know if you guys have checked out that company before, but Rally Road allows you to buy shares in collectibles. So they started with sports cars, but now like I own five shares of Game More Jordan shoes. I own eight shares of the, the floor from Kobe Bryant's last game. And they, so I've been talking about these cool asset classes that are coming up there. And he liked the fact that I was aware of it. And his comment to me when he came to me was, I know you can't do this for me, but I like the fact that as an advisor, you're thinking that way. That's what I want my advisor to be like. And then he started working with me. So my education in public, my sharing of my interest, and intentionally became a marketing a avenue for me. And I could probably double down on it more. Um, so there's that opportunity. But I think you're going to see both, Mike. I don't think there's one that'll dominate more than the other. I think it, it, you're right. And it allows... It's just a, a, a nice entry point for advisors to start learning and thinking about the space because what you just mentioned with Alley Road, you know, this is the NFT world. This is the ability to own a part or a, a sliver of a Mona Lisa, of the proverbial Mona Lisa, rather than one very, very rich person owning the Mona Lisa. This is going to become a liquid and important asset class that if you're starting from scratch five years from now, you're just going to be dead in the water. Like uh, the idea of starting with Bitcoin, learning about crypto and seeing where they can, where the many asset classes that are going to grow out of this is absolutely crucial. Um, so uh, I, I imagine that you said that uh, the current platform does Bitcoin and Ethereum. You're going to explore the DeFi world. Have you thought about the NFT world at all? Um, it's on the roadmap, how that plays in. I don't know. I would love to get Rally Road on it. And I've told Tyrone and Eric Irvin, our other co-founder, that I would love to see that happen. I know Eric likes Rally Road. Um, so I think that the more options that are out there and make them available to the advisor and then allow the advisor to choose which ones she wants to bring to the table for her clients is, is where we're going to go. Again, where it's not our, it's our, our job to say, this is what you should be doing. This is, here's the opportunities and we're going to connect those and bring them to you and make it super easy. Like it's going to be so easy as you're going to be able to log into um, here down in the States. There's a company called Advise On, which is like an all-in-one. Orion's another big one in the States. But basically I'm going to, I can log into Advise On. I can pull up all my clients' accounts. TD Ameritrade pulls in there. OnRamp pulls in there. I'll be able to open up an account and trade Bit or Ether from my advice on all from one place. So that's when I say bring bring the the crypto asset space to the advisor workflow. That's what I mean is make it super easy to fit into your planning software, your CRM, your portfolio management, and so you never have to leave that stack to be able to do all the work that you need to do. Uh, but on the NFTs, I think there's a lot of NFT junk out there right now because it's so new. But I've For one sure. hurdle one hurdle people have to get over is this fact that you don't physically hold this painting, like that digital art can't be real. Um, you know, we're, we're having a generation of kids that are growing up and all they know is the digital world. So eventually those who value the painting on the wall are no longer gonna be here and it's gonna be replaced by those who want the digital art that they grew up with. Um, so it, it's coming and it's just, it's one of those things where it's hard to believe that that's really what, the way it's gonna be, but these things all have the same characteristics. It's the you know, the token that shows this is one of one. It's the only one out there. That gives me the flex that I own this um, piece of art. Uh, so I'm I'm excited ab about seeing that come up. I don't know when that shows up on the platform, but you come. Yeah, yeah, of course. And that's what I mean by getting there early and learning about the crypto spaces. It's not ready, but when it is, the 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 kids today, kids today. Look at me. I'm so sounding so old. The kids today, um, you know, have they're going to find it and continue to find it hard to really grow their wealth in the areas that were traditionally wealth growing, like owning a house, like owning, um, you know, different uh, works of art, uh, participating in, uh, in certain offerings that are only available to accredited investors and so on and so forth. Right. Whereas in the, in the crypto world, you can fractionalize everything and 
participate with a very small fraction of your wealth in the growth of a very important piece of art or very important plot of land that's going to be developed in Cayman Islands. And there's going to be opportunities for young people to participate in the way that the boomers participated in, participated in global growth that, that currently is out of the reach. So when that time comes, when it's liquid enough and when there's availability, and maybe your platform will be one of the first, um, it's, it's going to be the only venue or avenue, one of the few avenues where you can really diversify those asset classes away from, you know, the, just the, the S&P 500 index-based stock market. You can do a little bit more with it. You can have non-correlation and ultimately, you know, grow that, that wealth in, uh, in a more thoughtful way. I think it's just the continuation so, of the conversion from analog to digital. What did we do with music? If you want music to be pervasive, and have everybody to have a million songs in their pocket. You need to digitize the music. You can't have it on a vinyl piece of plastic. Yep. And, and so... You Remember how difficult it was to get rid of those CDs, though? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's not <tough>. emotionally. <laughs> yes, very emotional. So you get music, I still have all mine. We took, uh, we took phone. Yeah, of course. I know. I was going to say Justin probably has them all in vinyl. <laughs> but you know, the same thing happened with VoIP and voice, right? The long distance companies didn't, didn't, you know, come up with VoIP. That had to be something where we carried the voice over zeros and ones and finances being disintermediated as well. What I think is, is also very interesting that came up in the conversation we had with Eric and Tyrone was the fact that on-ramp is not just getting pickup from individual RIAs who want to incorporate this into their, uh, into their workflow and into their client base. It's getting picked up from the institutions that represent large swaths of those advisors, which are going to be slower in the uptake because there's a lot more integration to be had, a lot more uh, boards to go through to get approvals. So, you know, from, from the standpoint of having a first mover advantage as an independent advisor, that window is still, I think, fairly wide open. And um, mm -hmm. what, what OnRamp is providing is giving you the tools, like they're, they're helping you eat, educate access and tools to, um, to have a differentiation in, in your business potentially that can create uh, alpha, better growth, can, can shelter your business from, you know, from the vagaries of other advisors attacking it, saying, hey, have you heard about Bitcoin? Or, you know, from you just organizing your thoughts and how you're gonna allocate and rebalance. Um, any thoughts there that you wanna elaborate on, Justin? No, nah, none of that. I think you said that very eloquently. I wanted to circle back to something um, that you said, Justin, or something that you said in passing when you were talking earlier about uh, on ramp in terms of leading with education. Um, you know, we were talking prior to that. We were just talking about advisors, you know, coming into the digital world, being the advisor of the future, and. You know, uh, one of the big sort of problems that, that I could anticipate advisors having with starting a blog or creating video or doing a podcast, do, do, creating any kind of content is the question, you know, what do I talk about? And, and you know, maybe the answer to that, the, the quick and dirty answer to that is what don't you talk about? And, and you know, when you lead with education, you can lead with the things that you're learning about. Like I'm, you know, we're, we're talking about on ramp and we're talking about, you know, how that's folding in crypto into the advisor business so that they can track it, they can manage it, they can plan for it with their clients. Uh, and there's a learning curve there. So, you know, I think that's a great starting point where, you know, all these new things that advisors need to get up to speed on are the kinds of things that they can write about or that they can talk about, that they can introduce that have nothing to do with what the ex expected return on assets is going to be or, you know, their, what their investment strategy is. But, you know, for example, what did your clients ask you about in your conversation today? What, what kind of questions are you fielding on a regular basis? What are the big, what are the big issues and topics that, that are coming up and so if you're wondering what to write about, if you're wondering what to, what to put out there uh, as, a, as an individual and, and how to add your own opinion to it or your own character to it, those are the really great starting points. Those are, those are the big opportunities where, where there really isn't anybody doing it. There's a real dearth of advisors 
doing a lot of this kind of blogging. And I remember, you know, from our conversation with Wes Gregg, you know, his, his, his beginnings, you know, when, once he was in the, uh, well, once he sort of elevated to the PhD program in Chicago, at the University of Chicago, and he was, he was digesting academic uh, papers for his own learning's sake uh, so that he could be fluent and interpret them properly. It was those blogs that got him the, the call from the billionaire family office asking, you know, will you come and work with us out of the blue? You know, you're doing something for one purpose and then suddenly it serves someone else's purpose and that purpose could be huge. You know, you, you've, you've had a nice evolution in your, in your business and the way that you grew your business uh, with RLS and how you've you, uh, evolved into AGC, Justin, and then and now on ramp. And, you know, you're not, you're not trying to grow your RLS wealth management business, but I suspect you're going to have a difficult time turning people away. You're going to have to, you're going to have to figure out because now they know, okay, this isn't Justin's primary business anymore, but I want him as my advisor because he knows all this other stuff. He's doing all this other, all these other things that are so progressive. He must know more. He must be fluent on so much more, but you know, so, so, I mean, if advisors were to actually put themselves out there and say, and sort of demonstrate, you know, I have so much going on in the community. I have so much going on in my family. I have so much going on in and around what I do every day. And I have so much going on with my clients as well. At some point, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have, you're going to raise that kind of interest where people are going to say, I want him as my advisor. I want her as my advisor, you know, to, to, because he's got, he's a real person. He's got a real place in the community. He does all this other stuff. He's not like gunning for me as a client. You know, he's not, he's not right. I mean, do you, yeah. are you having that situation where you're not trying to grow your business anymore, but it's still growing because people are coming at you? I still, yeah, I still get referrals. And that's something that like, I'll have to figure out a good way to, to I'm trying to tell my clients sometimes to take it on new clients, but they still refer. And so I've got to get more strict about that. But I will say one thing that I've been very mindful about appearance. Um, you know, I'm their financial advisor. That's how they came to me 15 years ago. And now I'm off doing all these other things. It, to Pierre, you, it could be a good thing that, oh, he's in these, all these different things. He's, you know, ahead of the curve, but it could also be, is he really taking care of my money the way he should be? Or is he off doing these other things? So that's been something I've been, I've tried to be very yeah. mindful of. And, um, one of the ways that you combat that is you deliver upon your promises. So, I've been able to maintain my role as their as their financial advisor, take care of them, deliver a high level of service so that what I'm doing in my spare time doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, all they care about is their money. And if their money's in good shape and they call and I answer and I'm there, we meet regularly, then they're okay. But I've explained to them, hey, yeah. I'm updating my ADV. You see this new group in here, the AGC. I co-founded with another advisor. Here's what it is. Here's how I'm combating that uh, as far as my time. So I've, I've been very mindful to just be transparent along the whole way of here's what I'm doing, here's why, and here's how I'm making sure it doesn't impact you. Like with OnRamp, it's based in San Diego. So I can have all my RLS stuff in the morning, switch over to OnRamp during the afternoon, still be a physical and be available if clients need it, but I can kind of segment my day out. So I, I expect no problems with my existing clients because I'm going to keep on taking care of them. And again, what I do in the evening and other times doesn't impact them. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that there is the component of, I want my advisor to be well-versed in doing other things and to be a human. I do think that that could be a negative for some people. I think some people want their advisor to be that buttoned up yeah. that the only crunches numbers, that that's all they think about. And that's perfectly fine. The beauty of it is there are more than enough people to serve that we could all be ourselves and be whatever that is. And there'll be enough people for us to, to find the way. So for some, they might like it and other people, they may not like that. And again, that goes all back to why I'm so big on being yourself, being authentic, because you just be you. So you don't ever have to feel like you're conforming to somebody else's view of what you, what they want you to be. Right. Awesome. Brings it full circle. And we've been at it for over an hour. What do you think, Jen? Should we hit him with the final question? Let's do it. I'm nervous. So Justin, so would you rather question, would you rather spend a week in the past or a week in the future? 
Ah, uh, that's tough. Especially because I'm so focused on trying to be in the moment. I would much rather, I'd rather spend the uh, time in the future. Um, I don't think there's any point in going back and changing the past. And my past has been pretty daggone good to me. So I'd rather go to the future, see what's coming so I can ad adapt and be even more efficient when I get there. Awesome. Okay. Very cool. Also, la All right. Thank, thank you very much. If you're enjoying this content, make sure you uh, share these recordings, like, hit that like button, subscribe to the uh, podcast that's Raise Your Average. And, and lastly, Justin, where can people find you if they want to find more out about all the stuff we talked about today? Give us the laundry list of your various uh, connections and, and where people can find OnRamp and AGC, AGC and RLS and Justin, et cetera. I'll give you, I'll give you one place to go. Uh, JustinCostelli.io. I see, I, I see that's good. I like that. I have a website that has it all. So, and actually it'll, it'll, it's being, it's in the process of being re redone. So I'm excited for that to launch, but JustinCostelli.io will take you to everything that I'm doing, all of the content, all of the companies, social media spawns off from there. So that's, that's the place to go. All right. Beautiful. So Justin, thank you so much. Always a pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you, Justin. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Justin.